Today it's my pleasure to introduce to you all uh, Christian Grauman. She is actually, um, she, she's not part of the audio world, at least not until recently, but she is actually an established and still rising star in computer vision. Um, she is a professor at UT Austin, a research scientist at FAIR, Facebook AI Research. Um, she's well known for her great research on visual recognition and, and search. Um, she's won several awards, um, just to mention a few, NS NSF Career Award, PAMI Young Researcher Award, um, and several BIS paper awards in CVPR and ICCV, the best uh, venues for vision research, and um, also won in 2017 a Helm Helmholtz Prize for the Test of Time Award for her research on uh, kernel pyramids, which you may have heard of. It's very, very well known in its seminal work. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to her. She's going to talk to us today about visually guided audio source separation um, from real world video. Um, it's awesome work and I look forward to it. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great, thank you. Hi everybody. It's really great to be here. Thanks so much to all the organizers for having me. I'm going to talk about some of our work that brings together the eyes and the ears. So the eyes being our cameras, the ears being our microphones. So let me set the stage first based on you know, what's going on in the field of computer vision and what we can do well. Well, as you probably know, we can do well some visual recognition problems, both with objects and activities. So how do we learn about these objects and activities? Well, we typically do it in a heavily supervised way where we can get lots of nice samples of each kind of category that we want to be able to recognize, have them labeled, and, and train up discriminative models. So the status quo in visual recognition, and it's served us well so far, is to learn from labeled data, especially labeled snapshots. These are static moments in time to capture things we want to learn about. And you see this prevalent through all these very influential benchmarks that are guiding our field, both for images and for video, where we'll learn in a heavily supervised way and most relevant for this meeting, in a, in a silent way, right? And so the theme of this talk is to think about what we get once we think about these visual problems, but with the benefit of sound. So how can we listen and learn, as well as watch? Okay, a glimpse of any everyday life activity, such as this one, tells us, of course, there's so much information there once we both open our eyes and ears together. And in particular, there's problems within vision that we can do based on the visual input alone, but naturally we can get much stronger once we're able to listen. And I just wanted to break some of those down. I won't talk about all of these in this talk, but here's what we can get revealed. So one, material properties. The object itself might not be a sound maker, but once it bangs against some other object, it reveals something about its material. The object identity, of course, so uh, objects that are sound makers that can tell us who they are based on the sound they emit. They emit. Dynamic sources, so in video, something that draws our attention not just because of how it looks, but an event that happens and maybe a sound that accompanies it. Spatial cues, and I'll be talking about this later today, thinking about how the sound tells us not just about what we're seeing, but where it is in the scene. Emotion, as we just saw in that previous example, that we can detect better in this multimodal fashion. And final example I'll give here, uh, scenes. So the ambient sounds in an environment, not just how it looks, but how it sounds, tells us something about where we are. Okay. So all sorts of nice ways we need to be able to capitalize on and lots of great work going on in the field to try and get at a number of these. In the remainder of my talk, I'm gonna tell you about two main ideas. And we'll be looking at moving from this heavily supervised and, and often static kind of way to teach our systems towards a way in which we can learn from unlabeled video. And it'll be multimodal because we're gonna use the video on both streams, the visual and the sound. And the two things I'll share, one, I'm gonna start talking about semantic uh, information that we're getting from these streams. And that's where I'll talk about source separation. And then in the second half, I'll talk about the spatial signal. All right, so if we think of audio as a semantic signal that's coming to us to tell us more about our objects, then a, a nice goal for us to have would be to have a repertoire of objects and the sounds they make. 
So to be able to look at video, especially unlabeled video, and come back with models for what these things look like and how they sound in the world. You know, of course, a natural challenge we encounter right away is that objects don't nicely exhibit their sounds one at a time for us in video. We're going to observe these things in a mixed channel with many, you know, many or few at least objects making sounds at once. So this is the technical challenge. How can we take a single audio channel with multiple objects and learn how the different objects sound? A good way to be able to test if, we're gonna, if we've succeeded at this goal is audio source separation. And we'll do it in a visually guided manner. So this is the problem where we have video as input. We'll look at both the audio and visual streams and perform a separation. And when we do separation well, we could come back with a soundtrack for each sound maker in the original source video. So one soundtrack for the guitar in this example and one soundtrack for the saxophone. Now this is a problem with a rich history of work. Um, earlier approaches would look at leveraging multiple microphones or looking at both the video and the sound and detecting low level correlations in them, such as a strong onset motion for a sound that would correlate with the onset of a sound. Now more recently, people have been looking intensely at how to tackle this visually guided audio source separation problem in a learning based manner where instead of taking a single video at a time and trying to do this processing to find the alignment and extract the sources, we'd like to be able to learn from as much video as we like in advance to then generalize and expect how to separate a novel example. Now among the various techniques that are circulating, there is a common th uh, theme that's emerging and we can nickname it mix and separate. And it's this nice idea, clean, where we can take unlabeled video to train and take two video sources during training, mix their audio, and then teach a system to disentangle those, right? Because we know the ground truth. We know what the original source sound for this video was. We know what it was for this guy. And so we can learn this extraction from the mixed audio to the separated audio. And this is an instance really of a self-supervised test, right? As much videos as we want to pair up and do this, we'll be able to learn. There's no manual annotation about how to get the right answer during training. Okay. However, there are some strong limitations that we need to be aware of of this basic paradigm. So the first one is that implicitly there's an assumption that we do have single source samples, at least some and often many, to do this training. And by single source, I mean that we do get to observe an object making sound by itself during training. Okay, it's not always a stated assumption, but it's there. Because if you think about it, if I only ever heard a guitar playing with a flute, there's no way for this kind of methodology to learn what a guitar by itself sounds like. Okay, furthermore, and related to this, there's an assumption of independence in these single recordings. Um, you know, for, for similar reasons, um, we if we're not able to learn from how samples, objects in the same sample sound during training, um, we're hit doubly because often the same kind of objects occur together, right? So um, the noisy street scene with the honking, you know, with the ambient sound plus the honking horn, um, those will often occur together. And so this independence is not holding to allow us to train this well. OK, so this is kind of the basic paradigm serving reasonably well. Here are some of the key assumptions that we think are limiting it. And now I'll tell you about our idea for how to address this. And the idea is, um, in hindsight, I can explain it kind of loosely uh, in analogy to what's called image co-segmentation. Has anyone in the room heard this term before, image co-segmentation? Just a couple. I can tell you the idea kind of with this picture in a few words. The idea is that if I have two images in which there's a shared foreground object, like the guy in the blue, then if, those, if that shared foreground object is against different cluttered backgrounds, I will have an easier time segmenting that foreground in the image if I do it jointly on the image pair than if I were to take one image at a time and try to find that foreground. And why? Because there is some commonality, even though it's mixed up in all this other clutter, that's consistent. And so a co-segmentation algorithm for image segmentation would leverage this consistency to better pull out the foreground jointly. Okay, 
So again, very loosely, that helps to explain our approach here on doing source separation in the video. So here is the big sketch, the, the sketch of the idea. We call it co-separation because during training, we are going to have pairs of data come through. And so here might be two videos in a pair. And we have object detectors. So we know how to detect some familiar objects, and that's what the boxes are on these frames. Now, from observing the mixed audio from those two videos during training, our goal will be to extract, again, this um, separated uh, audio signals for each object that we detected in the visual scene. So one for each of these, cello, guitar, violin, guitar. And then, in this sense of co-separation, what we're going to require is not only that we can disentangle the sounds that came from here, which we know during training, and the total sounds that came from here, which we also know during training, but most importantly, that we can pull sounds for any repeated object that are consistently identifiable. Okay, So we won't be told in advance what guitars sound like. We won't necessarily even have single source samples from which to learn that. But because we can visually identify a repeated object across any different category, then we'll require during learning that the sounds we discover to associate with those objects in training be consistent across instances of that object. Okay, so that's kind of the key um, idea, or the key insight for this approach. Let me unpack it a little bit more, show you the pipeline of how we train the system with the co-separation idea. Okay, so during training, again, now during testing you'll have one video, not two, but during training we'll take two at a time and be learning in pairs. So here are two training videos, V1, V2. There's the mixed audio, we can um, combine their audio signals artificially. Now we have the, the mixed audio spectrogram here. And in each training video, we detect objects automatically. So maybe in the top, we've detected a guitar and a saxophone. In the bottom, we've detected a harp. Now these become the visual focus, each of these different object patches of the confidently detected objects. Now those object patches will go through an audio-visual audio separation network and this is a module that can take um, the full mixed sound as well as this visual patch and will learn to produce the mask on that mixed sound that corresponds to the sound for that object. So here we're estimating a mask to apply to this mixed sound in order to get the sound for just the object. Okay, so that's what we want. Now the losses that will enforce or allow us to get this there's two parts. So the first is what we call co-separation loss. So this is the one that says, if we come in with this sound over here and this sound over here from video one, video two, they need to be recreated once I add back together the sounds of their objects. So there were two in the first one. Once we reconstruct the sound for that video, it should recreate. And there's just one in this one, so that should recreate the sound of the first video. And this is a paired kind of version of mix and separate. Now the second component of the loss is what we call that object consistency. And this is where we say that despite the fact I don't come in knowing what guitars sound like, anytime I see a guitar, I need to be able to place, recognize, um, based on its inferred spectrogram, uh, a reliable entity, a reliable class. Okay, so we're gonna have a cross entropy loss for this consistency loss that tries to bucket up these sounds coming from the objects that we are discovering. Okay, so it's, it's not recognizing them yet, but they have to be identifiable, consistently identifiable. And this is kind of the key point. So from um, here, let me just illustrate a bit more. So remember, there's three objects in this particular pair. And what we're saying is that during training, while learning both the audio and visual features, while learning how to do the separation engine, these separated object spectrograms will live in some audio feature space that we're in the process of learning. And to do this well, they need to be grouped, right? So those three came from a certain three objects that we detected. And for those objects and any others with those visual labels, they need to group together in this audio feature space. And that's what I mean by consistently identifiable. Okay, and then we do this across all the objects. So 
This is from real data where we did a TSNE on the learned audio feature space that was discovered during this multi-source video, uh, unlabeled video to train this co-separation engine. And this is from some audio set data. And so what you're seeing here is that the learned features for the audio stream are discovering alignment or clustering behavior amongst themselves for each of the different sound making objects. Okay, so that is the co-separation training idea. These two losses that say we have to reconstruct sounds from the source videos, we also have to maintain consistency in the object's sounds that we discover. Okay. Now the most important thing to take away from the approach and the thing that will give us the power is that now we can train with videos that have multiple sources in them which you could do before, but now we'll do this while being able to learn to separate those multi-source examples. In other words, the training video that comes in with these two is not limited to learning how to separate those two as a group. It will be forced to learn how to separate this instance from that one in that multi-source training sample. All right, so let's look at some results. We've done this, uh, applied this approach to a couple different data sets, um, audio set, uh, with some instruments, uh, musical instrument video from AudioSet, as well as a data set prepared at MIT consisting of music, people playing in solos, and people playing as duets. And the second data set is especially nice for control in our experiments, because now you can do something where you say, what happens if I only train with solos? A learning algorithm would love that, right? That's the nice way to isolate. Or what happens if I train with solos and duets? Or what happens if I train with duets only? Yes, question. Right, the system has object detectors. They're automatic, they're imperfect, but it comes in knowing how to detect saxophone or guitar, yeah. Okay, so let's take a look at results with these two data sets. Um, so this one on the top is from the MIT Music, the one on the bottom is from Audio Set, and we're looking at standard metrics for the quality of the separation, SDR and SIR. And we're looking at a comparison between our approach, which is called co-separation, and um, some classic techniques based on non-negative matrix factorization, um, a video-based mix and separate approach, or the work from MIT called Sound of Pixels, which also uses a mix and separate kind of objective. And the most important thing to see here is this difference between when we train with single source data, again, solos only, which is very nice and convenient for a learning algorithm, versus what happens when we ask these algorithms to train with multi-source data, meaning a mix of solos and duets. And what's happening here that's most promising for the method we've designed is that we're actually getting even a touch better once we're able to train with the multi-source data, whereas the existing methods start degrading um, based on now not having that assumption met of having availability of single source data. All right, so what does it sound like? Let me just show you a, um, a few samples. So what I'll do is I'll play a video, we'll listen to the original, and then I'll play a result in terms of separated soundtracks for the different objects, and you'll see which object is being separated by the object detection box. Okay, so here we go. Here's the source. Okay, and now let's listen to our separation for the violin. And for the flute. Okay, and then let's look at um, a competing technique that's not able to um, train well with multi-source video. This is a separation. And for flute. I'm going to stop with that one. So you can see that that assumption, once it's broken, training with multi-source data, that, that classic or you know, converging approach of mix and separate is just not handling it well, whereas you saw reasonably good clean separation with the co-separation method. 
Let me show another sample. We can listen not just to instruments, but to objects in general. Here's the source. Here's what we hear for dog. And violin. Okay, so depending which source you're preferring, you, you isolate just that. Um, of course, this doesn't always work. Let me show you a, a failure case that's representative um, where we'll see that when object detection is not working, or even more importantly, if, we've not have, if we do not have visual models for objects that are going to be sound makers in these videos, then it can fail. And also, hard cases are when there's a multiplicity of objects of the same type. So here's one such case. Okay, so that was the original video, and here's what we poorly separate uh, for guitar. Now, we don't have a visual model for person in this particular implementation, and so the voice is not being separated properly. Here's what we separated for harp, which is better in this case. Okay. Um, the final visualization I'll show for this part is um, kind of a hint of a result, a visual result. So what we want to move towards is, you know, just as we discovered those audio classes, we've discovered those clusters that we were looking at for what the different sounds are that go with each visual object. You can also think in the reverse direction where see, observing this consistency in sound could eventually allow us to detect the visual objects or discover the visual objects themselves. And so what we did for this experiment is we took not object detections, but what's called object proposals. And object proposals are, are windows in an image that are category agnostic, but look like objects, right? So there are a variety of detectors out there that aren't trained for certain object classes, but just fire when there's something that's object-like. So if you imagine grabbing a bunch of such proposals from all the frames in these videos, and then pushing them through the model we've learned, and looking for those proposed object windows that were most consistently, confidently classified into those audio classes we discovered. These are the windows that, that topped that list. And you can see that they are centered around objects. So because of the audio consistency, it's starting to, to discover among this pool of possible object windows those that are consistent with the visual as well. As well as some fun failure cases like a stripy shirt that looks um, consistently like the accordion and probably doesn't sound like it. But. Okay, so what I've shared so far is all about semantics in the sense that we're learning about objects, the sounds they make, so that we can recognize them and separate them in the visual and audio stream based on their identity. Okay, so now in the remainder of the talk, I'm shifting from semantics to spatial, where we look to the audio signal now for giving us cues about where things are. So just to motivate this, um, imagine yourself in this forest. Imagine yourself experiencing this scene. Okay, if you were in this uh, 3D environment, if you were experiencing it with your own tuned ears, you, like this camera person, would be able to pinpoint where that bird sound was coming from and then go focus your visual attention on it. Okay. So we know that we get strong spatial effects in audio, and we know that as humans we're getting this in our own bodies because of our two ears. So we have rich spatial information because we can observe things like the interall time difference, meaning the time delay between when a sound's reaching one ear versus the other ear, or the interaural level difference, how intense that sound is, because if it's closer to one ear or behind our head on the other side, uh, as well as even effects from the embodiment uh, of our microphones, right? The, the outer ear shape that's special to us and really um, has allowed us to learn this mapping between the 3D environment and the sounds that we observe to how we, how we can interpret them. Okay, great, so we have two ears. We're good binaural sound uh, perceivers. 
right? But on the other hand, our algorithms, more, more or less, are often paying a lot of attention to monaural audio, where sound is perfectly flat. And all the spatial information has been collapsed. Okay, so the idea we had was to look at this discrepancy and ask whether we could take monaural audio and lift it into binaural sound. Okay, so given a single channel audio, we'd like to lift it into the appropriate left and right waveforms. Now, we're, that's asking a whole lot, but if we're doing this in a visual context, we do have the, um, a missing link, right? So the idea is to take monorail sound accompanied by the visual stream and use that visual stream as that spatial cue that would allow us to, to map lift into this binaural sound. Okay, and we refer to this idea as two and a half D visual sound because we're um, increasing the spatial sense of the sound through the visual channel. Okay, why do we want to do this? I'm going to show you two examples today, so let me just foreshadow them here. The first is purely to upgrade the audio experience for a human listener. All right, so if you have off the shelf video and it's got monaural sound, well, if this approach would work, then we could lift that into spatial sounds so that when you experienced it with headphones, you'd feel like you were really there. Okay, so we'd like to upgrade the audio for a human listener. Now, the other application that I'll show you at the end today that's perhaps less immediately apparent is that this also can help us on our path towards good audio-visual source separation. Okay, and the reason why is that once we're able to have systems that learn to understand this link between the spatial notion of the sound and what's in the pixels, this would allow to also help do source localization in the frames and improve the, the audio representation's ability to disentangle okay, with that spatial element. All right, so let me say a little bit more. Let me say the, the big picture and a little bit more about how this works. So during training, we have left and right channels. So whereas before my blues and reds were object one, object two, now just remember this is left ear, right ear. Okay, two simultaneous audio uh, waveforms. Now during training, we have binaural sound, the red and the blue. We'll collapse that to mono, okay, artificially. Now we have the spectrogram for, for the mono audio and we also have the visual stream. So these are frames of video coming through at the same time. Now, during training, we'll feed both of these into a network that we need to train that's going to convert from mono to binaural sound. And again, during training, we know the right answer. It's the left and right waveforms that we had um, as ground truth. And so there'll be a lock saying that the right answer is going from this mono audio with this visual stream to produce this binaural sound. Okay, so supervised training, but in a sense, self-supervised, because so long as I have binaural audio captured, arbitrary video could feed into this network to help it learn this association. Okay, now test time, we have only mono and that's what we'll lift. So just a bit more detail about what this network looks like. So we have the visual stream, we're processing its visual features with a convolutional neural network, and so we'll have the visual feature, and then on the bottom here, we have that mono audio corresponding to the ground truth binaural. And we'll use a UNET architecture to link these two modalities together. Okay, so we're going to tile and concatenate the visual features to match up with these audio features. And what we're trying to predict now is a mask again. But now this is a mask not to separate sounds, but to predict the difference of the left and right ears. Okay, so we want to know what sound would I need to add or subtract to the mixed sound in order to get the left or the right channel back. So that's what we'll train for. We'll train for this mask that we can apply to that original mixed audio spectrogram in order to get um, the difference sound. And that we can reconstruct and add back to that original mono audio stream to, to recover the left and right uh, waveforms. Okay, and you'll notice that we are predicting the difference rather than predicting the left stream and predicting the right stream, which would also be a possibility. We found that it was more useful to predict the difference, um, likely because this forces to focus on those 
subtle differences, right? These two waveforms are not going to be all that different. In fact, a good baseline that we use is just to copy the mono stream twice um, and see how well that fares under the metrics. So predicting the difference is a, a more compact way to zero in on those subtle differences. Okay, so this is the approach. Learn from unlabeled video that has binaural audio and now uh, be able to lift for an arbitrary new video with mono sound to the binaural, or what we call two and a half D visual sound. Now to train any of this, of course we need binaural video, bin uh, video with binaural audio. And this isn't also plentiful, right? You need a little bit of special equipment to, to capture it precisely. So we first started, we did a video capture of our own with this rig that consists of some off-the-shelf components. So there's a 3D IO binaural microphone for the ears. And there's a GoPro up here for the eyes. And these are connected, you know, roughly in a head configuration. And, you know, these microphones are, are an average head representation of how one would perceive the binaural sound, complete with the shape of the outer ear. Now, we took this rig, which you can, is handheld, so you can move it around in the scene. And we captured hours of video in a music room at Facebook. So this is in Menlo Park, where there's this Music room, dozen instruments in there. People can come and go. We had volunteers come in different ensemble sizes to play music, sing, and then we captured these videos. So camera can move, instruments can move. Um, we're just gonna learn how to lift to binaural from the perspective of the optical center of that camera. All right, so we did this about five hours of video and this data is all public now. Uh, we also looked, you know, in addition to the data set I just described, there is a recent data set collected from YouTube videos um, that consists of 360 video and ambisonic audio. And this data is more varied in its content, uh, things like street scenes or concerts or um, tourist videos. So we have a mix of, you know, more controlled kind of data on the top from the Fair Music Room and this YouTube data. All right, so before I show you numbers on these, let's look at and sort of listen to the results. And I say sort of listen to because you really need um, headphones to experience the binaural sound we've created. And this is where, like, if I was Oprah, I'd say go under your chairs, pull out your brand new headphones, and let's get started. But as you know well, I'm not Oprah. So what you can do is go to our website if this interests you and, and listen there. Um, but, you know, we've been still thinking, I'll show you in a moment, we've thought of some ways to help you experience this even in a conference room like this. One way is for you to look at the waveform. So I will play the video. And the input to a system is the video in the mono, and the output is the red, uh, red and blue. And the ground truth is just below it. Okay, so you can eyeball our results at least first. <laughs> You can see that. Now, we've been thinking, you know, how can we better convey the spatial immersion of this to an audience like you? Um, so here's one way we've been working on where we did a user study where rather than show the person the video, we only let them listen to the video, uh, where we let them listen to our prediction of the binaural sound with headphones. So this is, you know, how the listener experiences it. Okay, with headphones. And now what I'm going to show here is where a user clicked when we asked them, okay, as you listen to this, where do you think the drums are? Green. Where do you think the piano is? Purple. Okay, and so this will just give you a hint of the person as listening to it with headphones where they're hearing these objects come from. Okay, so not so bad, right? They saw the drums pretty much in the right position and the piano... Um, just some angle off to the right. Okay. So please check it out if it at all interests you to hear yourself. We've even helped some YouTube users discover they'd been putting their headphones in the wrong ear. Okay, and I mentioned that second data set. Here's just one sample. Um, this is the one that's not music restricted, um, but it's challenging kind of YouTube-like videos like this one in 360. Well, thanks again for watching this video. Hope you enjoy more recipes on jeffmobile.com. Have a great day, and uh, bye-bye for now. Okay. So you can look at these to see um, how immersive or how, to what extent it's immersive to hear that sound. 
So when we quantify these things, we're interested in knowing how well are we reproducing the correct binaural sound. So we have ground truth on some test videos, and there we can quantify our method against a series of baselines here, including some concurrent work that works with ambisonics um, here in the first row. And what we're measuring then is just correctness. You know, in terms of the, the waveforms coming out, how well have we estimated them? And baselines that you see here, audio only. What if we weren't allowed to look at the video frame? Of course, this hurts performance. Flipped visual. What if we gave the left to right flipped version of the visual frame, which should hurt and does hurt performance because things are not lining up um, where they should? Or mono mono, and that's the one I mentioned where we just copy the mono audio twice because it's not going to be too far off as a baseline uh, to predict the correct binaural stream. Okay, and so we have some encouraging results here across these different data sets. Now, I showed you a hint of users saying where they hear the sounds. We also were interested in what has the network learned? In other words, what parts of the visual stream were most influential for it to be able to predict the spatial sound? And here's just two samples, top from the music room, bottom from a street scene in YouTube, and these heat maps are showing those image blocks that were they to come out of the scene would most uh, increase the loss on these samples. And what we see is that we are learning from the objects, and in fact, the sound-making objects. So it's focusing on uh, the woman who's singing and this person playing, as well as places where the cars are going by over here. <coughs> now, the user study I hinted at before, we've done in full with quantitative results. So we asked people to do two, dif two different things. One, we had them listen to the ground truth binaural sound without, um, and with, for a video. And then we asked them to listen to our method in a baseline in some random order and say which one sounded closer to the true binaural sound. So that's the first thing we checked. And so how often one method was chosen is shown here. So this is a measure of perceived quality from the same baselines I, I mentioned a moment ago. The other test we had people do was, again, to not look at the video, just hear the sound, and then answer a spatial question about an object. So you listen to the inferred sound, and we ask, where was the trumpet, center, left, right? And you have to answer. And so here's our result, again, in blue. Here's what people could do if we gave them the ground truth binaural sound, just to give you an upper bound. So even that's not perfect for, for people to discriminate, but it's, of course, the strongest. And then we see our method in the baselines here. OK, so this 2.5D visual sound is offering this immersive experience and a better 3D spatial sensation for people. Now, the final result um, that I'll show kind of brings these two threads together. So earlier today, I was talking about source separation as a semantic way to start to learn about objects and video. Now I've talked about lifting to spatial sound. Now, this lifting process itself, we find, is can be seen as a self-supervised way to embed spatial information into the audiovisual codes. And by that, I mean if we look at the representation that's learned by this monotobinaural network and then use that as a feature space in which to do separation, then we do get better separation results. OK, so the learning process that this system is doing from unlabeled video to know how to lift to binaural sound is organizing the representation in such a way that it's more amenable to compute the separation into the different soundtracks. OK, so before I close, I'll give you a hint of where we're going with this spatial understanding of sound. So in our current work, we're looking at um, not just human listeners, but autonomous agent listeners. So in the space of embodied perception, where we have agents that can explore, navigate in 3D environments, where you know, in recent, very exciting recent work, people are doing this with pure visual streams. But what we're looking at is how an agent that also can hear its environment, and in fact can hear a target that's, say, yelling for help, suppose, can hear these things in order to navigate more quickly. And I'll just give you a teaser video um, of the environment in which we're doing this. So you can see, imagine an agent that has its own binaural um, sound sensed from the environment and then can navigate towards a source, an audio source better. OK, so we're hopping to a few locations, moving closer or further from this source. And depending how we're oriented, we'll hear it differently, of course. OK, 
Okay, so this is underway where we're looking at how to do better target-driven navigation with both sight and sound. And it'll allow us to use that directionality very, very explicitly uh, to do this faster navigation. Okay, so I'm going to conclude here. What I've shown you today is our uh, recent work looking at unlabeled video as a source to learn multimodal representations of objects. And the two parts I showed, with, showed, showed you were, one, separation from unlabeled video, particularly multi-source video, and then two, the idea to lift to 2.5D visual sound. And Rohan Gao is my PhD student at UT who's behind all that work that I just showed you. And here he is in the fair music room with several of my other PhD students um, in this, this um, making some binaural sound and uh, of varying qualities, probably. Right. So that's all for now. Um, I'd be really happy to hear any comments or questions you might have. Thanks. Yeah, so we're predicting the, the, um, the mask on the, the magnitude spectrogram. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so you're recreating the phase difference. Mm -hmm. Ah, I think you're saying are the, is there the right, the right structure in the predicted uh, left and right? Yeah. 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 So we haven't, I don't have a good way to tell you today of how we've quantified it. What we are thinking about is imposing such kind of structure during the learning. Because right now, I think what you're getting at is, you know, we, to the extent we minimize this loss, we're free to learn to create whatever combos we like. And there's probably some nice ways to inject a little bit more geometry or physical information into the learning itself, um, which is something we'd like to do for future work. Okay, um, the video, it looks like in most cases you have a, <clears throat> a consistent view of the sound sources, right? The camera never goes off of them. Mm -hmm. um, so in a lot of less controlled environments, you might have in a concert, for example, the camera will pan to the audience or something like that. How much harder do you think it gets if you don't always have all of the sound sources Right, yeah. So it does get harder. Now, it doesn't completely fall apart. So when we process a longer video, like these videos even, we're doing it in chunks with a sliding window. And so even in that case, you know, there'll be chunks of the one you just described where the sound sources are foreground in the, object, in the camera view, and then they may go out. Now, if the part where it's fa it would fail in your example is the chunks where it's totally out, right, because we have no visual detection for the object then. Um, but I think that this is, you know, one, one thing, so two things. One thing in the model that I didn't describe that helps towards this kind of issue of objects going in and out is that we have what we call a background class for the audio. So for objects that aren't making sound at that moment, such as the crowd when you went to the concert and you're looking at the crowd, um, they can be pushed towards this bucket for background sounds. Um, so that's kind of the most we can do right now. But I think it's an important question to handle more fully of long form video and doing this even beyond a sliding window way. Yeah. One more question. Sorry, could you say it again? I couldn't hear the rest. Uh, the training was binaural for the Fair Play data set, and Ambisonic converted to binaural for the YouTube data set.
Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the visual model here is deprived of motion, any serious motion. I mean, we are sampling, we're doing more temporal pooling over these chunks of video to find good objects, but just like you said, it's very, at, after that point, it's really just looking at objects and moments, whereas motion is critical and not exploited well here. It's critical especially in these cases where we have similar, you know, objects making sounds with similar frequencies or fine-grained ones like human speech, which isn't tested in these models, but we would get a lot more power by looking at the motion in that case. Yeah. Um, just one more. Uh, so uh, get along, along the same lines, if you had two instances of the same type of object, like two guitars, two flutes, then your model would not be able to work, would it? Uh, and is there any evidence that it, it can exploit anything more than just the label of the category? Um, evidence, like, like from uh, any work. Try feeding in just the label and see if you get the same performance. Ah, yeah. Yeah, we've looked at this, right? Because there is some feature learning on the visual side happening here, too, right? This is connected and then, um, and so there is the value of having that object patch as part of the learning. Uh, this is something I was wondering, too, and so, yeah, we've looked at this. If you just treat it as throw away the visual and now it's a label, the results are not as strong. Right, yeah. so like a classical guitar versus the Western Right, right, yeah, and we're hoping to pull this out. You know, I'd love to see that doing this, then you could, you can imagine learning those kind of fine grain differences, like you said, and also postures, you know, so there's body poses connected to these instruments and the sounds, and if your visual is um, fine grain enough, then, you know, whether the person was high on the keys or low on the keys, this would come out of the visual stream. Yeah. Uh, this thing is 